Okay, well, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Brenda Mascoro and I am serving as a panelist today, but also uh, moderating. Can everyone hear me okay? Sounds good, great. Well, welcome. Um, today, um, we're just gonna go ahead and jump in. Um, I, if you guys have any questions, remember you can add them in the chat. Um, I will get started just by introducing uh, myself and the panel. So as I mentioned before, my name is Brenda Mascoro. Um, I am currently in Miami. I am a PhD student at um, FIU, Florida International University. Um, and um, today we're gonna be talking about improving health inequities through, um, uh, I'm sorry, I just, I, I, there we go, through resident engagement and community empowerment and cross-sector partnerships. Um, I'm, thank you, Ashley, and Ashley's controlling uh, the PowerPoint presentation for us today, so um, we're going to be doing this together. Um, just a little bit about the rest of the folks participating on this panel. Um, let me first um, explain that we, uh, Ashley, uh, Dr. Falcon, Falcon, and um, Leah uh, Lopez will all serve on a board of directors together. And that's one of the pieces that we're gonna be addressing today. And we'll, we'll get into that in just a moment, but I did wanna take a minute to introduce the panelists um, and introduce myself. So as I mentioned, um, my name is Brenda Mascoro and I not only serve on uh, the board of Healthy Little Havana, I'm also the committee chair for the housing committee. Uh, my background is specifically in affordable housing and homelessness. Um, I'm the former executive director of an organization called the South Alamo Regional Alliance for the Homeless. Um, and that is a continuum, the continuum, continuum care lead agency for Bear County uh, in San Antonio, Texas. And so before that, I worked for an, the largest affordable housing, nonprofit affordable housing uh, developer in South Texas as well. So again, my background is in affordable housing, uh, but we um, at uh, Healthy Little Havana work together with a whole bunch of different expertise to come together and really work on what matters the most. And um, what, one, of them be, one of the things that we work on is how uh, addressing social equity and addressing health inequalities. And so again, thank you guys for being here. And let me just introduce you to our, the rest of our, our panel. I'll start with Leah. Um, and um, just a little bit about um, Leah. Leah, Lo Leah Catalina Lopez is an in-house attorney for a Fortune 500 company. She holds a law degree from the Universidad de Cartagán and also received her Jewish doctorate from Florida International University College of Law. She is licensed to practice law in Florida and, and the Republic of Colombia. She's passionate about diversity, inclusion, and is very involved in the South uh, Florida legal community. Leah is part of the board um, of the Gwen S. Cherry Black, um, Black Women Lawyers Association, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee of Florida, of the Florida Bar serves as the co-chair of the DNI Committee of Miami Dade Chapter of Florida Association for Women's Lawyers, and is a board member of the American Constitution Society of South Florida Lawyer Chapter. Um, so, Leah, you are on, on um, here in a bit, but I just wanted to go ahead and get introduc introductions out of the way. So, thank you so much for being with us. Um, next, um, let me see. One second. I, for some reason, closed my on my windows, uh, that's... My apologies. There we go. And technology. It's great until it's not. Okay, great. Um, so I also wanted to introduce uh, Dr. Ashley Falcon, uh, our vice chair for Healthy Little Havana. Ashley is an assistant uh, professor at the University of Miami School of Nursing and Health Studies. After receiving her master's in public uh, health, specializing in health education, she studied, studied uh, border health issues on the U.S.-Mexico border while, um, at, while at the centers of control of, uh, of disease control and prevention. Ashley served as a wellness administrator for over a decade and received her doctorate in epidemiology. Her research focused on sexual violence prevention, overseeing the evaluation of Miami-Dade County's human trafficking, victim support services, phys uh, physical activity promotion, and eliminating uh, healthcare disparities for people with disabilities. 
Alrighty then. So I just uh, wanted to say thank you to our presenters uh, for, for joining us today. Um, and we can get started now. Thank you. Um, so what we're going to talk about today um, is an organization um, called Healthy Little Havana in Miami Dade, in the city of Miami, uh, in Miami Dade County. Uh, just a quick background on it, a little bit of the history, and um, we'll get into, into the, the meat and potatoes in just a second. I just think it's helpful to know what we're talking about so that way we're all on the same page. Um, a little bit of the history of Healthy Little Havana. Um, Little Havana was selected as one of two community partnerships that uh, received an investment of up to uh, about 3.7 million to improve uh, community health over a six period, a six period a year time frame. Um, then uh, in 2013 to 20, between 2013 and 2016, Connect Familia served as the host agency for Little Healthy Havana Community Partnership. Focus was primarily care, uh, physical activity and behavioral health. And then between 2016 and 2019, the city of Miami served as a host agency for Live Healthy Little Havana Community Initiative to promote healthier living in Little Havana. Um, and for you all that are not from Miami, we'll talk a little bit about the specific geography of what of where uh, Little Havana is located in Miami um, in, just, in just a few minutes. And then um, just more recently from 2020 to present, um, Healthy Little Havana is an independent community nonprofit organization who focuses on social determinants of health. Um, and for those that are not familiar and those that are, I, I apologize for you know, telling you about something you may know a lot about, but the social determinants of health um, includes, a, includes a focus on conditions in the environment in which people are born, in which they live and they which they work and where they play, where they worship, et cetera, and where they plan to age. Um, and it affects a wide range of our health and quality and life, uh, quality of life and um, health outcomes. So it, we really do focus on those social determinants of health and we'll talk about it a bit more in just a moment. Um, righty then, so a little bit more about Healthy Little Havana. Um, before I get, that, get to that, I just want to mention that um, the, the Healthy Little Havana as at its state um, is, is fairly new. It's a, a fairly new, although it has a little bit of a long um, history, the way it's uh, structured right now is fairly new. I personally am, am fairly new to Miami um, and I, I learned about Healthy Little Havana and decided to join the board because, uh, because of, of what they stand for and because of their mission and their vision. And so um, just want to mention a little bit about what, again, what what um, what what the Healthy Little Havana is, and then we'll get um, into more about the topic. So our vision is to create health supportive neighborhoods where all of Healthy Little Havana residents can thrive. Um, the core values that we stand by are community, equity, empowerment, integrity, collaboration, and growth. Um, our mission is to support and advocate efforts to strengthen Miami's Little Havana neighborhood by focusing on the social determinants of health. Our focus areas are housing, education, employment, public space, uh, health access. And so if you look at, um, on the side of this slide, and the, uh, the little person on the side of the slide, um, you, you, you'll see that some of the areas to focus, about 40%, um, include socioeconomic factors such as education, job status, family, social support, income, community, safety, um, then we have um, a physical environment, and then um, we have about 30% where we focus on health behaviors such as tobacco, and these are just examples, tobacco use, diet, exercise, alcohol use, sexual activity. And then we have about 20% that we focus on is about on access to care and quality of care. So a um, little bit more um, healthy little Havana seats um, policy system, policy systems and environmental change. Um, we go beyond the programming. Um, we target infrastructure that influences health and pr pr promote sustainability. Um, if you look at the, the, the pyramid here to the right hand side, um, it just gives you a little bit more of uh, a visual of, of the focus areas. Uh, if you see at the very top, um, and, and you see the arrow on the bottom, it goes from smaller impact to larger impact. So to just get an idea of some of the services provided and also some of the areas that we'll be focusing on today for our conversation. 
So if you see at the very top, um, we see counseling and education. Um, examples of that are, are like healthy eating and exercise. And again, we'll, we'll touch base on those in just a few minutes. Clinical intervention, medicine for high blood pressure, diabetes, and then long lasting preventative intervention, uh, vaccine, smoking, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, smoking sensa sensation um, and colonoscopy. Um, and these are again, examples of some of the services we, pro we provide. Um, then changing the context to make individuals uh, default uh, decision, uh, decision healthy, default decision healthy. And so examples of that um, are, are listed, some smoke-free laws, tobacco laws, et cetera. Then socioeconomic factors, um, and we focus again on poverty more generally, education, housing, and inequities. Um, then I think the next slide where I'm going to is just a little bit. More. This is a just as an example of where we, where we stood uh, uh, not very long ago as an organization. The organization has since, has since then grown a bit. We now have an executive director. Um, then the executive director that reports to the board of directors um, also has a director of social determinants of health and uh, equity as health equity. Um, we have program manager. Then we have community liaisons, and we also have operations and finance coordinator. So just a little, just to gauge, give you a little bit of a, an overview of what the organization looks like from an organizational standpoint. Um, and with that said, um, I'll turn it over to somebody who I believe is way more interesting than I am <laughs> um, uh, to just walk us through um, uh, Healthy Little Havana and collective impact and, and a couple of other very interesting things. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you so much. So happy to be here. I'm actually pinch hitting for another board member that wasn't able to be here. So, so excited for the opportunity and to, to share a little bit about the work that we do. Uh, so how do we do this work? How do we address the social determinants of health on a policy systems and environment level? That's, that's a lot to do, right? So one organization alone can't do that work. So we use what we call a collective impact framework. Um, you might have heard of it. Hopefully you have if not, let me walk you through it. So the idea is that there are a lot of nonprofit and you know public organizations, agencies doing this work. But if we're really going to solve these big problems, we have to do it in a coordinated effort. If you look at the, the image right there, you can see kind of individual pockets of excellence where everyone's kind of doing great work and meaningful things, but on a smaller scale and possibly at, at times kind of competing with each other or hindering opportunities or not taking advantage of opportunities to uh, to collaborate and synergize. So the collective impact framework kind of capitalizes on the idea that we have strength in numbers. If we have coordinated efforts, we can really work to more effectively solve complex issues. So we're really trying to have shared goals, strategies, and action plans. So just to kind of give you an example, I co-chair the public space committee. Uh, so here are just some of the partners that we work with uh, you can see, I mean, if you're not familiar with Miami, let me just give you an idea of, of who's on this list. So we certainly work with our local uh, elected officials and, and governmental agencies. In public spaces, we're doing a lot of work around parks, so parks and recreation, uh, physical spaces with, you know, trying to improve walkability and pedestrian infrastructure and safety, so transportation of public works. Uh, we do a, a bit of work trying to kind of clean up our environments with solid waste. Uh, but you can see a lot of partners in the academic realm, different universities. You can see urban planners. Um, you can see foundations that provide funding sources for things like urban tacticalism. Uh, a, a lot of our really active partners right now are very environment focused, uh, where we're talking about you know, the impacts of climate change and how to be climate resilient, other factors about environmental safety and protections. Um, you can see organizations like QEBAT and Resource City, uh, Resource City, which are really cool organizations that are bringing new technologies to uh, find out how can we use advanced innovative technologies to address some of our issues. So KiwiBot has automated delivery systems, and we've used that along with Resource City's kind of ability to, you know, connect people to resources or increase access to, to information and engage the community. So a lot of different partners. So it's really finding where our missions and work kind of align so that we can do that collaboration. So let me show you what that means in terms of collective impact. There's five key conditions that collective impact kind of embodies. The first one is that common agenda. What exactly are we all trying to do? What is our North Star? Where are we headed? 
are we on the same page? Do we all have that shared vision? So we came together, all those partners, and we decided on what those priorities were uh, based on the feedback from the work that they've been doing in the community, based on feedback from the residents that Leah will talk a little bit more about. Uh, and we created a community action plan or a CAP. This is our roadmap. I'll give you a, a small taste of, of what this looks like from our public space committee perspective. But once we have that, we were able to put together shared measurements of what exactly are we going to document initially at the baseline, but also long term to see, are we even making progress? Are we moving the needle in the direction that we want to? What is evidence of success? Uh, so we do that from, from that standpoint of also holding each other accountable, which is a, a big piece of the puzzle since there are a lot of partners involved. Uh, but of course, we're all working in that same direction with mutually reinforcing activities. We all have slightly different missions that overlap. So we find opportunities to collaborate, especially when grants come up and we say, oh, you know what? I know exactly the partner that would be perfect for this. And I would want to call them up and I want to have a conversation about what we can do, uh, what we can, what ideas we can put on the table and submit so that we can get some funding to do this great work. And really the the way this happens is through number four, continuous communication. I find that, you know, a lot of this has to do with just networking and relationship building, building on established foundations of trust where we like to work together and we're more effective in our, in our work together. And, and that's really essential, right? So having conversations with partners on a regular basis, having monthly meetings, having monthly newsletters, ways to keep people engaged and informed so that we are able to do this work. And really the last piece is, is arguably one of the more essential ones as well in the sense of, you know, you have to have kind of one entity that is really driving this work. All these partners kind of have their day job and are wearing multiple hats, right? Uh, so it can be, you know, it's easy for things to kind of fall through the cracks unless you have a dedicated staff working towards pushing and, you know, pushing the, the efforts, maintaining the momentum. And so, Healthy Little Havana serves as a backbone support organization that actually has dedicated staff, funds, resources that try to ensure the continuation and the coordination of all these efforts across partners, projects, grant proposals, you name it. So that's essentially what collective impact looks like. Now, let me talk about a cap, right? Our community action plan, right? So for, for public space, we, our focus is emotional well-being and physical activity, um, and also creating a, 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 a physical environment that is welcoming and engaging and accessible to all. And this, of course, is something that is always an evolving experience, right? Making sure that we're doing right by the residents, listening to them, adjusting course as necessary. So if that's our umbrella goal. What are the, the tangible, measurable items that we're doing within it, right? And just showing you this as an example, uh, just to kind of show you the, the five main areas for public space that we are focusing on based on feedback that we have from partners and residents. Um, but basically the takeaway here is that for each of these items, we have identified measurable metrics. We have data sources where we can find that information, both baseline and then progress over time. We link it up with the, the projects that are, are, are working towards making these adjustments or making this uh, progress. We link it to the partners. We have all this information that allows us to hold ourselves accountable and demonstrate the efficacy of the work that we do. All right, so just to kind of run through really quickly as an example of public spaces, because that's the example we're gonna talk about, just one of the projects that we have worked on. You know, one of the things we focus on is increasing public space. How are we going to prioritize funding for this effort? How are we going to incentivize the use of public space for the public good? How are we gonna bring uh, property owners on board into this conversation to get their support since our residents are largely um, renters, which that's a big part of our conversation. Um, so you can see the various objectives in the, in the kind of the in, you know, black font is the, are the projects. If you wanna check out our website or ask questions or anything more, I'd be happy to elaborate on them. Um, but other things we focus on are making sure that we have culturally and linguistically appropriate park um, uh, signage, wayfinding to parks, utilization of resources within the parks. We focus on, excuse me, um, just the safety of getting to and from parks. Are people comfortable with whether 
crime is real or perceived, do they feel safe actually getting out and walking to parks to use those spaces? And once they're there, are they quality parks? Are they park features that are safe, they're accessible, that are, are fun for recreation? What are we doing to uh, make sure that we provide that opportunity that equitable opportunity for green spaces in the community. Not only that, but also reducing barriers to access. We have, you know, occasionally found, you know, issues with lack of lighting or issues with permits being barriers, things like that that are brought to our attention that we work on developing policy solutions to address. Uh, and is safe routes to common public spaces. So accessing routes to schools has been a big feature, not only parks, but schools. So how can we do that to make sure our youngest residents can do that in a, in a safe way and feel comfortable doing that so that they can be more physically active, just going to and from school. And then lastly is one of our kind of bigger project areas. And this is what Leah is gonna talk about a little bit about how we do community engagement with Nibajio. But this is a focus of how can we improve the aesthetic of the community, right? When I came into this community wanting to do research in the physical activity realm, I learned very quickly that we're not there yet. And why are we not there yet? Because we have issues of illegal dumping and littering that are getting in the way of people wanting to be physically active. So fix that problem first, and then we'll talk about physical activity. So that's one of the things we've done with this project. We're really trying to, to raise awareness about how to properly dispose of things, addressing challenges with why people are forced into situations where they have to dispose of things in an improper way, giving them increased access to local dumps, things like that are the focuses of this project. So I'm gonna uh, stop right there and I'm gonna transition to Leah. She's gonna talk a little bit more about that specific project and how we do that through our community liaisons. Thank you, Ashley. And I wanna thank everybody that's present um, and the organization for having us. Um, I'm gonna talk about my favorite part of Healthy Little Havana, which is the people that make Healthy Little Havana the great organization that it is. And that is the community liaisons. Healthy Little Havana's community liaison program is designed to engage the community through the community liaisons. And who are they? They are members and residents of the community who have become advocates and champions for positive change in Little Havana. What they do is, as I said, they're residents themselves, but they connect other residents with the nonprofit organizations that we work with, with community stake, with community members, with stakeholders, with local government agencies to advocate for the community issues. One of the big things that we do in Healthy Little Havana is empower. And we started doing that by empower the community liaisons to become advocates for change and then they empower the community itself. The CLs also, or how we call them, the CLs also develop training goals, one-on-one -on -one support programs and execute uh, trainings and programs. They have been empowered to participate in the decision-making, project co-design, project implementation, mobilize, mov mobilizing the community and capacity building. We have the grants, we receive the money, we create the programs, but it's the community liaisons who, as the name says, they liaise with the community to get them to become involved in, in the programs that we're supporting. Um, but what community is, do, do they serve? I wanna tell you a little bit more about Little Havana. And Ashley, if you can move the, to the next slide. Little Havana, um, or La Pequeña Havana, I'm a resident and I wanna tell you something about the statistics of the community. The community that we serve has over 80,000 people living here. About 92% of them are Hispanic, 33% are foreign born. And it's estimated that of that foreign born, born 46% do not have U.S. citizenship. This is important to know because we need to highlight uh, the needs of the community. About 50, 55% of the community is undocumented and that goes to what their primary needs are. The medium household income of Little Havana residents is 22%, 22,000 uh, a year, while the county medium uh, household income is 50,000 a year. Uh, the program that we're going to talk about, Porque Amo Mi Barrio, Cuido Mi Barrio, for those who are not uh, Spanish speakers, because I love my neighborhood, I take care of my neighborhood. Um, it was developed and implemented with several project partners uh, in Florida, 
And the project is about uplifting the community and focusing on empowering the residents to join the city, the partners in making the neighborhood safe and healthy. If we can move to the next slide. Awesome. And then the next one. Uh, Healthy Little Havana and its partners are working in the widespread issue of littering and illegal dumping, which adds stress and discomfort to the residents in their daily lives. You see it every day in Little Havana. People come from other places to dump their, um, to dump their trash, essentially, and it's the residents who become affected. The CLs have done training, help the community voice their concerns to public officials, organize cleanings in Little Havana, and encourage the discussion of issues that affect the neighborhood. These little posters that you see on the screen are writings by residents themselves in one of our projects and one of our community events. We ask them through the CLs and when we're present there, we ask them, what do you think the community needs? What are the issues related to legal dumping that you wanna see change? Uh, what are your ideas? So we're essentially engaging the community and empower them for them to raise their voice and make that voice heard. Um, if we can move to the next slide, these are a little bit of examples of the, the work that we have done in the community. Um, and we have empowered the community, the residents through the community liaisons to not only be part of the change, but engage nonprofits, civic leaders, and politicians and county organizations to care about this issue and to hear the residents. So we not only do cleanups, we do um, just meetings with the residents to talk about them. We encourage them to assess to town halls by, by uh, politicians, to encourage them to write letters, to just become active and involved members of the community. This is only in the public space um, realm that we're talking about, but it will affect all the other uh, social determinants of health that we are uh, focused in. This is just uh, one of the events that we have had. So we, what we do is um, we plan the themes, the activities, the outcomes and work with different partners in order to engage the community. We have done recycling, uh, composting of food, uh, of uh, composting of food sampling demonstration. We have brought other community partners to work with the, with the residents. Um, if we can move to the next slide, which I think it's the last. Well, there we are. Uh, we appreciate the time that we have shared with you today and we're opening the floor to questions or if Brenda and Ashley have any other comments. No, I just wanted to say thank you again, Leah. Um, I, I have to tell you that I always appreciate your passion and um, where you're coming from. And um, I am very interested if anybody has any questions, um, we're happy to take them at this point. And if there isn't any questions, we have <laughs> a couple of things we could talk about. We, uh, we thought our, our presentation may run a little long and it didn't. So we were talking about, we took out a whole bunch of things that we wanted to talk about. And, um, and, and if, as we're talking, if anyone um, has questions, I was about to say that. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, just if you think of anything you want to add it in the chat, or if you just want to come on, raise your hand, um, we're happy to answer those questions. Um, I see that there is one question, I'll answer it, and then uh, we can answer it and then go from there. So, uh, Ashley, I don't know if you want to take this or if you want me to take this. The question is, did you see any specific model that you follow up for community engagement? Uh, really, our, our community liaison framework is, is, is the model that we follow, uh, follow along with collective impact. Those are the, the ones that really are our, our, our guiding principle. But I'm always open to, to hearing more if you have a model that uh, you have used or heard of that you find effective. We're always looking to kind of give some more structure to, to the process. Absolutely. About the, I would like to say something about the community liaison. So the model to explain really what, what they do when they work, they have, I imagine on their cell phones, so many numbers of residents because the residents call them, message them. We have WhatsApp groups. We have one-on-one -on -one discussions. The liaisons one, have one-on-one -on -one discussions with the residents. So it's really a one-on-one -on -one relationship because 
the community liaisons are part of the community. Uh, they are residents themselves. They all live within Little Havana and within uh, the, the organization. And they really, you know, we pay for their Wi-Fi, we pay for their phone because they really have, have built a relationship of trust with the residents. And I think that's something that we need to highlight. Uh, not only, yes, they provide information, they encourage, but the fact that, you know, they've been working with the community for about, since the inception of the organization, some of them, and even before, I think uh, Brenda explained some of the history of the organization. So before, even before we were a standalone organization, we had community liaisons when we were hosted by other uh, bigger organizations. So the work that they have done has, you know, spanned for about five years. And the level of trust that the residents have in them, that's why, you know, I wanted to say they, they are our biggest assets. They are, you know, our very valuable employees and part of the, the family that uh, Healthy Little Havana is. So the model, I don't know that that's, you know, a name of a model. I'm a lawyer, so I don't know a lot of, a lot of things um, regarding public health, but I have to say that it's a personal relationship that they have to engage the community. That's when. That's why when the community liaisons go to the community and explain something and reach out to them and talk to them about, well, we have this event, this is what we're working on. They do a job of education about the social determinants of health and they do a job of empowering the community itself, the residents themselves to advocate for those issues. I think one of the biggest barriers that we have with communities in need is information. And that's what we try to do in Healthy Little Havana. This is, in the inf this is the information that it's going to help you. This is the information that's going to uh, improve your life. And this is how we're going to help you. Yeah, and then I'll just add to, to what Lee was saying, because she, she's making me think of other things. Yeah, I don't have a, like a set model per se, because that doesn't, that's my, you know, not my background. Um, uh, but definitely number one, as has been alluded to, one of our guiding principles is hiring within the community. So that is number one. There's nothing like having an insider doing this work and hiring our residents a little event to be the community liaisons, having leadership. And there are also residents like Leah is very important to us. Um, another challenge has always been finding where to reach the community. Uh, so we've worked very hard to figure out what are the best avenues. So we've done door to door, knocking on people's doors. We've done having Having community liaisons kind of assigned to specific uh, segments of the community where they reach out to certain types of partners, you know, collaborating with law enforcement to uh, create programming and, and policies around making people and residents feel more comfortable um, collaborating with law enforcement, for example, or working with schools, working with uh, nursing homes and elderly. Right? So that's another avenue. Uh, we've also in the process of interacting with residents, ask them, how do you like to be you know, uh, contacted? How do you like to receive your information? We do um, uh, tend to use WhatsApp as a, as a means, in addition to, uh, to social media channels, as a way to provide information uh, to residents so they, they can get the information, but they don't feel overly burdened with excessive messaging or, or they don't uh, get an email that they're not gonna read. So that's a really important uh, component. And then the last thing I'll, I'll add is just, the element of co-design. Everything we do is co-designed by, by residents. Um, even when we talk about our committee work, having um, input as far as co-designing even agendas, in addition to what's in our community action plan, uh, what um, outputs come from the various events that we do, input on policy scans and impact assessments, all those types of things we put together. Always the process is co-designed the outputs are reviewed by residents and, and partners so that we have this kind of re revolving door of feedback loop to make sure that there's always that guidance from within the community. Another thing that uh, we want to highlight, we always, and I think that Brenda mentioned this before, but we are bilingual. We make sure that the events, the posters, the connections that we make, we make sure that it's it's a given that most of the target audience or the you know the residents that we're trying to help are Spanish speakers and most of them don't speak English, don't know the language. So we are bilingual. We might have meetings in English with our partners, but we make sure to deliver the news and information, the posters, the documents, the the resources in Spanish. So make to to make sure that those residents are being you know 
are are being uh, included in the conversation and are being are 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 their information is being shared with them in a way that they can uh, properly understand that that they can properly assimilate it. I just wanted to add as well. I, you know, it's funny when people start talking, you start thinking of things initially you blank, and then. Um, so, you know, one of the things about uh, when it comes to community engagement, and, and I agree, I don't think we used another specific model from, from somebody else. I, I've been at organizations where we find a different model and, and we end up using it because we liked it. I don't think that was the case here, but what I like about um, the model that we are using, and it's something that um, uh, Ashley alluded to, but um, I would like to expand a little bit more uh, on it is that a lot of the programs morph into something else. Um, an example of that is the Guardianes de los Parques uh, program um, that, you know, it starts as, you know, a group of community members trying to clean up uh, the, the parks and then it became, it became a, a lot bigger. It became more people are now involved in, in more um, civic engagement and more, you um, political and policy driven um, uh, initiatives. And so uh, what I've noticed is that, uh, you know, from, from a model standpoint, it, it's a model that really uh, empowers the residents. And so it may, we, may, we may have a task at hand, but it always becomes something different. So just to share a, a, a quick story, um, when I first moved to, to Miami, um, I said I wouldn't, uh, wasn't going to get overwhelmed with serving on boards, and I, I left a, 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 you know, a, a career back home, and um, I wanted to really focus on this PhD and focus on, on it only. And um, but then when I started covering for one of my colleagues at, uh, at one of the housing committee meetings for Healthy Little Havana, I learned quickly that um, the organization wasn't like any other that I, that I knew of. Um, again, I'm from Texas and uh, I, it, was, it was very different um, than, than what anything I had seen before. So although we, didn't, we don't necessarily use other models, we, we hope to at one point be used as best practice across the nation because uh, some of these practices that we're using are, are really um, quite different and, and quite innovative. And the other piece is to, to expand to, uh, on my story, was that I remember um, meeting uh, some of the folks on, on the board of directors and, and you both, um, both panelists um, pointed out that, you know, the first thing uh, Leah said is just, she said, I, I, I'm a lawyer, <laughs> um, I, you know, when it comes to models or anything, help, you know, it's not, it's not her area, right? And actually the same. And so the beauty of, of this is that the folks involved are from completely different fields. Um, you would think that, um, for instance, myself, I, I do housing, affordable housing, um, that affordable housing wouldn't be um, a, a person with uh, that has an area of focus of affordable housing, wouldn't be the person to really go to for a lot of the questions on health equities, but it actually is um, because you know, in, in my past um, experience, we, we've partnered with multiple insurance companies, health insurance companies and, and medical um, departments at universities. Um, for instance, an example of my previous work was we partnered with um, an organization called Medicines, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, um, and Backpacks, and I, I can't remember the exact name, but essentially what it was is um, doctors that would uh, serve um, homeless individuals out of their backpack. And, um, and it was to addressing homelessness, right? And again, my background is in homelessness and housing. And then we have another, uh, and which makes a difference. And then we were able to grab, the, get a lot of the data and the research to, to, to really see what the impact was of, the, of that program. And, and, then, and, and then there's an, an affordable housing, just looking at how uh, preventative um, uh, opportunities allow us to really help um, the community, especially when it comes to the communities that we're serving that are, are low income, that have um, limited resources, and, and to really focus on things that you wouldn't think to focus on, um, like the social determinants of health, um, really does make a difference and does make us a bit unique. Um, and again, it's one of the things that, that, um, that attracted me to the organization, hence why I now serve. And although I was promised that I was going to volunteer uh, not very much of my time, I volunteer a lot more <laughs> of the time. And, 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 and Leah and, and, and Ashley know about this. Um, because once you know of an organization that's really truly making uh, a difference and you, you, you see the impact and 
you see them tackling those important pieces like social equity matters, um, those important um, issues that that are going to make a difference and you, you kind of have to be a part of it, right? And so I know it's a long way of answering that question, but um, but that brings us to another topic that we, we decided to kind of cut from the presentation that I think is important is that we all come from different um, backgrounds um, and, and we um, may, uh, may have a, a very different audience here from, you know, both practitioners and academics and, but like, for instance, uh, you know, epidemiology and, and, and law and housing and, and policy all those things do, do matter. So I, I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about ourselves. And then if you guys have any questions as we talk, it's just about the backgrounds themselves, um, about how you feel that your background, Ashley and Leah, um, really put you in a position to, to serve not only the organization and, the, and to add to the collective impact, but also um, how, it, uh, how, how, how it helps you. Um, having that 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 different background, so I, I I don't know if Ashley or Leah you want to go first, but um, just you know that's just a question that I think we we should get to. Um, I would say when not only my background is in law, but I think the fact that I'm a resident I, and I specifically I care about this community not only because I'm part of this organization because I live here and I spend you know I, I spend most of my time here. I work from home. I walk to the grocery store. I see the chickens walking with me. Uh, you'll see that in, in Little Havana. Uh, but my background in law, I think, I, I wouldn't say specifically my background in law. I, I don't serve as the, um, the counsel for the organization. But um, I think that when I think of the law, I think of information and access to information. And that's where I see, um, yeah, where I see my background helping me, helping, helping the organization. Um, if I spend uh, at least, uh, try to spend at least a day at the office with, the, you'll see that we're a very manager, uh, we're very, a very involved board members. We're not, you know, out there only in the board meetings, but we're all part of the organization. We'll all work and write grants and, and just be very involved with the organization. So I'll try to be and spend time with the CLs and their staff meeting that they have every couple of weeks. And you'll see people knocking on our doors every time because you'll see residents, some resident inform another resident about, about the organization. They'll knock on the door. And if I'm there, you know, I've had people be, you know, I just got here from my country 10, 10 days ago. And you'll see that very common. It's very common to see. And I don't know where to get the information. I don't know what to do about X and Y. And when I'm there, I'm able to provide some sort of um, information regarding legal services that might help them or county organizations or civic organizations that might help them. So I think that we all use what we know in the sense of we all have different types of information for, given our different backgrounds and we're able to use and access that background to help the residents. It's a really, you know, I, we're a very, I feel, homey organization. We're very one-on-one -on -one relationship with the residents. And, and I think that that's how, um, how we can advance, how we advance our, our goal. Thank you, Leah. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. So, so my, my background is public health and I, I did not know what collective impact was prior to Healthy Little Vanna. And it was a great opportunity to see it in action. You know, for me, it's you know educational for me and for me trying to educate my students about kind of what what on the ground work looks like and and that I think is something that I'm able to to you know provide as an academic partner. So I oversee our public health practicum students, which are senior level students that need to do community work um, and kind of develop their sense of civic um, self. And so it's a really awesome opportunity because you have students that are, are trained in program implementation, behavioral change theory, and, and whatnot that are, are needing to work with the community, that want to work with the community. Uh, so we oftentimes will bring on several interns that uh, are able to work with the community liaisons, assist um, with grant writing, assist with program implementation. Um, I've had a whole classes work on kind of fleshing out some of the evaluation aspects of our community action plan. So, so when we talk about civic engagement, it's not just empowerment to the community, but 
trying to bring other resources to the community and empowering them to also serve as resources for the community. So I think that has been kind of my contribution in addition to just having kind of a research eye and being able to, to you know, assist with grants and, and kind of the research mechanisms uh, that kind of feed into evaluation work. Um, right now, we just uh, are beginning our very first institutional review board approved um, research project based on some of this uh, successful work we've already done with regards to addressing COVID um, vaccine hesitancy in the community. And so being able to assist in that way is, is kind of a cool opportunity to kind of bring my worlds together. So, so that's, uh, I think, the benefit. And I think that that's something to think about if any of you uh, are working in academia or have academic partners, or maybe you want to start to look for academic partners to see how they can, can contribute to your community efforts. Exactly. Um, and, and, you know, I'm glad you mentioned um, the, the COVID, during COVID, the initiatives that, that were, that Healthy Little Heaven had to um, not only lead, but also undertake and how flexible the organization was. So although, you know, in, in public administration, so my, that's my background, we, we learn about different models and how on structures of organizations and organizational theory and, and, and so on and so forth. But at, when, when situations like COVID um, uh, arise, every, everything has to shift. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't with the organization during, during that time, but, um, from what I, during the time, I mean, I'm still with the organization or on the board of the organization, but during the time where there was a lot of need, there was testing needed, there was Healthy Little Havana because of its vision and because of its model and because of its um, flexibility in the model, we were able to step up. I, actually, I don't know if you want to talk a, bit about, a little bit about, you know, how they stepped up and, and what, what their role was during that time and how it shifted. Sure, and I think that speaks to the strength of a collective impact strategy or framework when you have so many established partners that you know are you know partnerships that are built on foundations of trust and previous successful collaboration. It it really becomes easier to mobilize. So in the instance with COVID nineteen, um, finding partners, and we do have partners that are clinical partners, um, clinics in the in the community, and so we were able to work with them right off the bat to get testing sites up. Um, figuring out what, be, based on the community liaisons, feedback from the residents, what, when should we be offering these at what times in the day? You know, you can't just offer them whenever. They had to be in the morning hours before people were going to work and, and after hours after they got off of work, things like that. Um, beyond that, we also realized that food insecurity was a big, uh, a big challenge, not just in general, but exacerbated by COVID. So we got involved with partners um, both government officials, but also nonprofit organizations to make sure that we were uh, assisting with food distributions. Uh, and we've continued those efforts um, uh, with, uh, you know, expanding to vaccination, education around vaccination, access to resources for how to, to get a vaccine, where to go, correcting misinformation, uh, all those types of things have really been easy to, to accomplish or, or less, less challenging, I would say, because of the collective impact that just kind of facilitated the, the, the expansion of, of the work that we do. Exactly. Okay, great. Um, one, one last thing I just wanted to mention, as, as you were talking as well, you know, from a housing perspective, yeah, when you were when you were mentioning the things that you were mentioning, I was just talking about, I was just talking to one of my former colleagues who talked about how you know, you can provide, and she's a medical doctor, but she's also an attorney. She's one of those uh, very, very um, uh, competitive individuals that can do anything. And how can you help um, individuals? She was asking how you can have help individuals with um, treatment and to get better when they're ill, when they don't have a home, right? And so that, that was a question she asked. And, and it was one of those things that, you know, really makes you think about how important something such as housing is. And as many of y'all know, we are struggling right now. And we are in a time of an afford where we have an affordable uh, housing um, shortage and what we may call a crisis. And so that's one of the things that, you know, organizations that may be focusing on on, some, on, on important topics such as um, health disparities and, and, and um, specifically, programs um, or specific, have specific models, you know, 
they don't have the ability to also look at how housing and the lack of affordable housing and the lack of housing in general really does impact the health of individuals and families and communities. And so one thing that's happening currently here in, um, in our specific um, geographic area that we focus on of, of, healthy, of Little Havana um, is that there, there is a lack of affordable housing and, um, and, and that impacts everyone. Um, even the staff at Healthy Little Havana, um, they are all, we encourage staff to be residents of Healthy Little Havana. Well, about 80% of them disclosed in the survey that they were at risk of losing their, their housing in, in the next year in the next, or six months because of, of the lack of affordable housing and also the rising rents and, and everything the, that is occurring in, in the neighborhood. Um, with that said, so now it's our responsibility. We have sub, there's subcommittees within the organization that um, that focus in on that. And and for instance, my committee is housing. So now we have to determine what um, housing, what specifically, not I, but my I, as a collective impact, the group that is part of the committee has to focus on what what are we going to do. And, and that's our responsibility for that specific group. And at the end, it all comes together where we focus, even though we're focusing on that and, and, and Ashley's the, the chair of public space group, she may be focusing on that. At the end of the day, it all is, comes together and it, because it's all, all, all impacts each other, right? Like I said before, that question that was, I was asked well, how do you treat someone? Um, and the example of this medical doctor, also attorney that she shared with me was this one patient um, was telling her that she go, he went to uh, public restrooms to try to change his, his, um, his, um, his uh, what do you call it, Ashley? I'm sorry, the, the goss and all that. It's, there's a term for it. Um, and so what is it? <laughs> Their coverings or, or whatever it may be. And so he, he would go to public restrooms. Did you want to say it? <laughs> what? Uh, I thought you were, we wanted to say it. there's a there's a term she used a medical term, and so she he would use um you uh, he would go to a public restrooms to try to get that done, but it wasn't very he wasn't very successful because um, because of a couple of different reasons and at points it was even worse because of the sanitation um, uh, sanitation um, uh, difficulties that he would face. And so again, all things that are very important, people need to have homes, people need to have medical care, people need to have a community. So um, again, th that's one of the pieces that we really focus on is how we bring all those important components together. Um, okay, I know we are kind of closing up on time. Is there any final thoughts um, for any of the panelists, Leah, Ashley, or any other questions anybody would like to ask? Um, we have about five minutes before we need to pretty much wrap up. I mean, just as a final thought, I mean, in all the work that I do in, in this, I mean, it all starts with, you know, talking to people and listening to what they have to say, and then, you know, finding common ground and, and, and moving together from there. I mean, so, so if you have any, any follow-up questions about how we manage to do the, this work, happy to, to answer those questions. You have our, our emails um, from the slides, but otherwise just Happy to, to answer any questions in the future via our emails there. Um, but yeah, best of luck. Uh, if you're dropping just out of curiosity or, or if you're doing this work either way, best of luck to you in that, in that process. Okay. Leah, do you have anything you want to close up with? Or you can no, I was going to say, well said, Ashley. Thank you so much. Okay, great. It looks like um, we're giving everybody about three minutes of your life back. <laughs> Every time I'm, I, I always I always try to give people at least two minutes of their life back if we uh, finish a meeting a little bit early. So um, I, I want to say thank you to everybody for joining. Um, we really appreciate your time and we hope that you gain something out of the presentation. And, um, and again, thanks so much. And we'll stay on for like two more minutes if anybody wants to stay on to, to chat or have any questions or have any additional questions. And again, our, our emails are on the conference website. So let us know if you want to reach out after. Great. Thank you. Ben, are you good? You're good to close out and do whatever it is you need to do. <laughs> Our volunteer, Ben.
<laughs> he, he's got multiple things going on, I'm sure. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm working on multiple rooms. Oh, yes, yes, I just was saying we're good. Thank you so much. We just ended and so. Very good, so I, I've recorded this and it will be posted and eventually uploaded to YouTube. Perfect, thank you so much, Ben. Bye. Bye, Ashley, thanks so much, everyone.